everybody that's joining us. It's lovely to see so many and welcome to this our second uh, webinar in our series. Uh, and it's lovely to see that some people are already, hello Anne, uh, uh, introducing themselves in the chat box. Please indeed uh, use the chat box so that you can say who you are and where you're from. That will be really lovely for everyone to know who's joining this webinar. And we're going to give it a few more moments uh, so that our other colleagues uh, can join. And so please introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, lovely, hello Jennifer, lovely that you are also joining us. Uh, uh, greetings to you in Myanmar as well. So please introduce yourself and also please make sure that your um, cameras are off and that your speakers are muted. Uh, also a reminder to uh, everyone to also, uh, especially our speakers, to make sure that you also have got your phones on silent. And welcome, lovely to have our Alive and Thrive team from Cambodia with us as well. That's wonderful. Ah, so lovely also to have our UNICEF uh, Cambodia team joining and our Ministry of Health from Malaysia. Amina, lovely to have you as well, as well as Live and Thrive from Myanmar joining us. Department of Health in the Philippines, yes, Rosemary, lovely, thank you and a warm welcome to you as well. So please do continue to introduce yourselves uh, in the chat box. It's really lovely to know who all is with us. So. Also wonderful, thank you also to see our colleagues from Vietnam joining us. So you are also most welcome. And also our colleagues from uh, Lao PDR, excellent, lovely to have you with us. And also colleagues joining us now as well from the Philippines, uh, that's wonderful. It's so good that even in these difficult times, we can still all be together, though we can't be together in person. So we've got a wonderful representation across countries. And I'm just going to give us another minute uh, for other colleagues to join us. Also, uh, great Jakarta, our Indonesian colleagues, thank you. I see Alive and Thrive in India also joining us. So uh, that's fabulous, as well as our World Food Program uh, colleagues as well. You are also always welcome. It's great to have people from the ministries as well as from other organizations. Dr. Sher. Uh, having you join us, Adi, is excellent. Thank you for also sharing with everybody your website in case people want to know more about the work that you're doing um, in humid Jakarta. Great, and colleagues also from Myanmar. So continue to introduce yourself in the panel, uh, in the chat box. So we're going to now uh, begin our session. It is uh, the time to get started. And I'm just going to remind everybody, please remember that the chat box, which you are using now, is for exactly what you're using it for, to just greet each other and share where you're from. But you will also know by now that there's also a Q&A box. And we will ask you to use the Q&A box to pose any questions that you might have to our speakers uh, after they have presented. So please make sure the questions are not posed in the chat box, but rather in the Q&A box. Today's meeting is the second in our series of three. 
And I'm just going to outline for you the objectives that the team have set for this meeting. Today's webinar is going to focus, as you can see, on pre and in service learning, a really important topic. And we will explore with various country examples how we can train, support, and build capacity in different ways, both during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. We're seeing that the pandemic is giving us many wonderful opportunities to do things differently and explore new ways. And those of you that attended the first webinar, which the recording is available of if you missed it, will really see that countries have been very innovative in how they have addressed issues during the pandemic. But these are many things we can continue in our journey forward. We're also going to review learnings from recent country programs and consider implication for future programming. And ultimately, we really hope that the benefit of this webinar will be that you can leave with some very specific actions that are relevant to your country context in order to utilize pre and in service delivery and learning in order to deliver high quality maternal infant and young child nutrition services, which is ultimately all of our aims. So with that, uh, for those of you that did not uh, meet Roland Kupka, uh, the new regional representative of nutrition for uh, the region, he was at our last meeting, but Roland, lovely to have you with us at this meeting, and I hand over to you for the opening remarks. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, greetings from Bangkok, and I hope uh, you're all well and, and safe. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, so many participants to this Alive and Thrive UNICEF webinar on creating MIYCN-friendly health systems in South Asia and beyond. Um, as Jane mentioned, um, this second workshop is focused on pre and in-service learning. Um, I think we're really in for a treat. We'll get to examine progress in curriculum development discuss global and regional tools and processes to take interventions to scale, um, and also look at how learning modalities um, have been adapted to address the new realities we're dealing with um, and how to work with online learning for MIYCN uh, in the region. Best of all, um, we will also hear from different countries and how they have adapted their learning for online platforms and integrated online learning with face-to-face -face supervision, uh, supportive supervision and skills-based training. Um, this webinar, as um, many of us know, will help us prepare for a workshop planned for early 2021, where we will all come together to develop forward-looking um, action plans to better position MIYCN interventions as part of overall health systems strengthening efforts. So again, welcome to this uh, second uh, uh, webinar. Um, and as the first main component of, of this webinar, I'd like to now introduce a short video on one of the key tools available to us all um, on online learning um, for IYCN. Um, this is a free publicly available online course designed to provide guidance, skills, and practical information to health workers to promote, protect, support breastfeeding, as well as complementary feeding. Um, this course is based on the 2012 WHO combined course uh, on growth assessment and IYCN counseling, and it also includes additional content from uh, different organizations, including WHO, UNICEF, the Global Health Media Project, and the Australia-based uh, uh, Raising Children Network. Um, the course is unique in that um, it is very interactive. The interactive content includes videos, graphics, um, 
animations, audio clips, uh, all of which aim to um, engage the users um, and therefore help also with learning and promoting interactivity. Um, it also has lots of additional links and references to promote further uh, learning. So we do hope that this um, e-learning course um, can help us expand access to quality IOSCF counseling um, and that it will therefore be of use um, in the different uh, regions present here in this webinar. So again, welcome. And I do hope that this uh, webinar will be uh, useful for us all. workers are so critical for, um, the, for women uh, to, to breastfeed their children. This course uh, uh, gives you the opportunity to hear uh, some of these updates from the most authoritative voices you have in the world. Any resource that we have that will help sustain and spread good knowledge, uh, useful skills around how to promote, support, and protect breastfeeding, and age-appropriate and nutritious complementary feeding uh, is an extraordinary asset. It's a great pleasure to be taking part in this course because uh, Reaching health workers with the right messages, the right information, and the right skills to promote breastfeeding is absolutely essential if we want to improve breastfeeding rates around the world. Those words are quite true. Absolutely essential for improving health around the world. So please feel free that you can uh, participate in that e-learning course. If you're not certain about how, uh, please feel free to contact your Alive, or Thrive, Alive and Thrive and UNICEF colleagues. We're going to now move into our first presentation uh, for today. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Paul Zambrano, uh, Paul is the Regional Technical Advisor for Alive and Thrive in the Southeast Asia region. I think he's known to many of you. And we have asked Paul to give what we call the framing presentation, which is really looking at how improving pre- and in-service learning can better deliver quality MIYCN services. So, Paul, without any further wait, lovely to see you and over to you. Mm -hmm. Participant, fellow panelists, uh, thank you for joining us and making time to be with us on what's shaping up to be an historic day, uh, an historic week for the world. I'm happy to share some time with you as well and to discuss and to frame our uh, the next very interesting and very engaging presentations. I'm here to set the stage, so let's get to it. Next, please. Next. So before we start, we'll be, we'll be using these terms a lot in the next presentations, but just to make sure we're on the same page, when we say pre-service training or learning, we are referring to the training that happens as a prerequisite to accreditation or licensing, usually received by health and allied professions, such as doctors, nurses, midwives, in some countries, nutritionists, dietitians. Whereas in-service training refers to the training that is received by health workers once they are employed or in the course of employment with the objective of, of updating their skills or to ensure continuing professional development. Next. Next. 
next. Paul, it, I think we uh, the slides are not matching on your screen. Uh, okay, so uh, if you go to the previous one, please. There. Okay, so uh, we saw the video on introducing the e-learning course. I won't go into as much detail. Uh, Roland uh, introduced it very well. But just to say that when we developed this e-learning course, of course, we did not know that the pandemic would happen. Uh, we developed with the intent of uh, helping to address some of the gaps in in-service training, but also to augment pre-service training. We wanted it, we want our, our focus was really on two key areas. One is making sure that the content is authoritative, hence in, uh, the reason why we engaged uh, oversight from a technical steering committee composed of global experts, including uh, UNICEF, lactation counselors, experts in community health worker training, etc. And, and uh, it's also the reason why we use the IYCF counseling course and growth media materials, among others. The second key area, which is our own limitation, is in technology itself. So we engage an external partner who are experts in the technology, and we work together to make sure that this package is responsive to the needs of our end users. So I hope uh, you encourage your peers and take a look at the IYCFHub.org, and, and we're open to feedback that you may have regarding the course. Next. Now, we know that we would not be here this afternoon if, if uh, health worker training didn't have its challenges. We know that both pre and in-service training have inherent challenges that we're all familiar with. So I won't go into much deep in, in discussing each of them. But I will say that the challenges are common to both and the pandemic I think, amplified or emphasized more of these, more of these challenges. It, 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 it magnified them even more. But we would also, next piece, we would also not be here this afternoon if there were no opportunities that also arose before the pandemic and during or at the onset of the pandemic that we, that, um, that, that, uh, would not, that if there were no windows of opportunity for us to take collective action. At the regional level, we have what's called the ASEAN Mutual Recognition Agreement or MRA. It's intended to facilitate the flow of medical professionals uh, among the ASEAN member states. And, it, it was, uh, and after adaptation, it was uh, specific professions established uh, a profession-specific MRA, specific, uh, such as nursing in 2006, medicine and dentistry in, in 2009, and with varying progress by state and, and profession. I will go into more detail on what could this, this could mean for us in the long term. Next. We also have opportunities in the form of how countries are shifting or adapting their national strategies, either in response to the MRA or as a natural progression in the development of their health worker training. We'll see more examples of these later. But there are also opportunities and resources to make sure that when we engage with this process, we are not doing it blindly. We are not going in there as purely nutrition people without the tools to help us. Roger, uh, sorry, Roland introduced the learning course, that is one, but we also have the WHO mod chapter on infant and young child feeding, which was developed to be, a, uh, to be integrated into textbooks of health and allied medical professionals. So this will help address gap in standardizing the content. We also have a model chapter in the works on maternal nutrition, and, and we'll uh, watch the space for more developments in this uh, in this model chapter. We also have uh, within each country updates to national guidelines. When a country issues national guidelines for the first time, whether it's for micronutrient supplementation or breastfeeding, it's an opportunity now to reflect on the curriculum of health workers and check whether these need to be updated. We also have methodologies now for assessing curricula, both in terms of its content or their content, and to what extent they train health workers adequately on the competencies, meaning competencies, meaning knowledge and skills. We'll be hearing one presentation later on the outcome of such a of, of applying such a methodology in the region. Next. 
So this is a uh, rather busy slide with, with a lot of text, but let me run you through it very quickly. So in preparing for this presentation, I conducted a rapid scoping, a note on rapid scoping of several countries in the region to determine whether there have been any recent changes or even ongoing transitions in their, the first column in how health workers are regulated, the second column, whether the curriculum is being updated or changed, Third, in the type of health workers that are regulated or professionalized in the country. And in the fourth column, whether there are any opportunities or windows in in-service training. And what we found is that for many countries, at least for the countries where I was able to do the scoping, there were recent strengthening of regulation. Lao, for example, has recently strengthened their licensing of medical doctors. For the second column, many countries also have either recently or are currently updating their curriculum content and structure. A good example is in the Philippines where the, the medical curriculum transitioned into a more competency-based curriculum with more focus on knowledge and skills and not just knowledge. And in terms of the last column, the improvement to in-service training, also a lot of opportunity there in adaptations of new technologies, uh, new shifts in integrating licensure with in-service training modalities. But we also see a lot of change with the adaptation of digital learning platforms. Next, please. And digital learning is something not new to us. It, it, it was a growing industry before the pandemic. It has grown much more since the COVID-19 pandemic struck. I won't go into these figures, but if you look at the dollar amounts there and the expected growth, then it's indicative of where this market is going. Next. So to, to, to further illustrate this shift in adaptation to digital learning, the, uh, the graph on the left shows the increase in traffic in the main or largest massively uh, open online courses. As you can see there, that not just web traffic in, that it's not web traffic that increased since the pandemic happened in March, but also registration. So around 35 to 30% of total registered users platforms only came in after the pandemic. So these MOOCs registered as many users in April 2020 as the whole of 2019. Next. But this is again an imperfect technology or an imperfect solution. There are inherent inequities to digital learning platforms because internet access alone is very variable across countries. If you can look at this graph uh, and the figure on the right, you can see that, yes, we do have countries such as Singapore and Brunei Darussalam, Thailand and Malaysia with over 80% internet penetration, but we have four countries with less than 50% penetration. Okay, so, and the number of total users does not, does not necessarily translate to a high internet penetration rate. Next. If we, go, if we go a bit deeper into mobile connectivity, then this digital divide is also present in terms of the quality and speed of mobile internet connections. So this has implications on how we apply mobile technologies to digital learning. We have countries like Philippines with 6.3 Mbps, but countries like Myanmar with almost 15 Mbps speed. So it's uh, the, the quality and access is not equal uh, within countries and across countries. Next. But of major concern to us also is the digital gender divide. Even between males and females, there is unequal access. And this is not only present, but worsening over time. So the gap between male and female internet access increased by 7% from 2013 to 2019, not just in Asia Pacific region, but in the world. And internet penetration in the Asia Pacific region as of last year shows that a significantly higher number of males are accessing the internet. Next. So in addition to these uh, inherent inequalities or inequities in internet access, we also are should be mindful that digital learning or any learning for that matter should be continue to be protected against commercial interests with high uptake 
in high catchment and high uh, and, and high usage of these digital platforms in the coming months and years, we need to remember what this what the World Health Assembly resolution recommends, which is that companies that market foods for infants and young children should not create conflicts of interest in health facilities or throughout the health system. And for health workers, they should avoid these conflicts of interest. But as we can see now, companies are already taking advantage of this high uptake in digital digital learning. We've seen it in the Philippines before the pandemic, much more after. And we have a screenshot there. I'm not in any way promoting this course, but you can even take a course that's sponsored by a formula company that will give you CME units. So clearly it is a gap that's being filled by part of COI. So we need to act see with conflict of interest. So we need to act with some insert urgency to make sure that this does not persist and the culture of dependency on these companies does not to e-learning. Next and last slide. So before we head to the next very interesting presentations, just to say that uh, when, when, wh whether it's e-learning or whatever, we, it's what we teach is as important as how it's taught, who is doing the teaching, and who, who we are teaching, and the rest of it. Never forget that knowledge and skills are equally important. The pandemic emphasized gaps, offered solutions, of which digital learning is a part, but it's not solution and I think that the way forward is really blended learning and thankfully we'll hear a very good example of such an approach this afternoon so that's my last slide thanks everyone over to you Jane thank you so much Paul and for really highlighting such interesting information around things that we're not always aware of in terms of the penetration of internet and the role it can play but also remembering the clear limitations and then very much highlighting also for us how important it is to avoid conflict of interest because, as we know, the companies are also always often one step ahead of us in public health and are really trying to use this opportunity during COVID to also make sure that their voice is being heard loudly. So we need to keep that in mind. So thank you, Paul. And you'll join us later on the panel. It's now my pleasure to move on to our next presenter. And again, I think uh, Dr. Mary Christine Castro, known to many of us uh, as Dr. Ina. She's the executive director of the Nutrition Center of the Philippines. And I think many of you know her because she has great expertise and has done uh, work in this area and is going to be presenting to us on the review of pre-service education on essential nutrition actions for maternal, infant, and young child nutrition for health professionals in the ASEAN region. So Dr. Castro, you are most welcome and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Jane, and good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting this afternoon a study that NCP did in 2018 among four countries in the ASEAN region with the support of UNICEF and Alive and Thrive. Next. Okay, so with regards to pre-service training of health professionals, this has been a long neglected area. And in fact, pre-service training uh, often occurs in parallel with in-service training and sometimes they are contradictory with a lot of uh, new gra newly graduated health professionals not being able to effectively implement MIYCN programs unless they unlearn some of the things that they learned in, during pre-service training. So the efforts uh, to address the gaps in pre-service training, one of the efforts as mentioned by Paul a while ago was the WHO model chapter, uh, which was published in 2009 and contains the standards for standards for, pre, for MIYC and content in pre-service training. Uh, in addition to this, there's also the WHO and UNICEF efforts to come up with a comprehensive in-service IYCF training package. Uh, next. Okay, so the objectives of the study that we conducted were as follows. So we had to collect and consolidate uh, pre-service training curricula for doctors, nurses, and midwives from the four countries listed here. We also uh, gave an overview of the medical education system and described the roles of the different types of healthcare providers in relation to MIYCN within the health system. 
we looked at the MIYCN content in terms of theoretical and practical training that it offers for its students. We identified gaps in pre-service training, uh, best practices, and recommended appropriate strategies for addressing these gaps. Next. So for the desk review, we collected the course curriculum uh, and syllabus for four courses in the four different countries. And we reviewed the content uh, using a checklist that was developed in coordination with UNICEF and Alive and Thrive. We also conducted key informant interviews among the three different types of stakeholders listed here. Next. So once we got the copies of the training curriculum, we checked them for inclusion of these components, which were also in the checklist. Based on the comparing this to the checklist, we also identified gaps and asked the stakeholders whether any monitoring activities were being done on the implementation of the curricula. Next. Okay, so for the four countries, we were, uh, we were able to collect the course curricula for the four courses, medicine, nursing, midwifery, and nutrition in Indonesia and the Philippines. Uh, for, however, in Lao, PDR, and Myanmar, we were only able to collect the curricula for two courses, that's nursing and midwifery. Uh, the nutrition course at that time in 2018 was not yet available in Lao, PDR, and in Myanmar. Next. So with regards to the listing of topics, in the curriculum of the four courses. So on the left, on the first column, we see the different topics and the green means that it's included in the course curricula, curriculum. Okay, so for the medicine and for nutrition, you see that all subtopics are included. However, for nursing and midwifery, there's much variation and that's what the yellow um, color means is that there's variability in the inclusion of these topics in the curriculum. And if you think about it, it's actually the nurses and midwives who are the first uh, contacts, points of contact of, in the public health care system of mothers and caregivers. So this is a large gap that we need to address. Next. Okay, so uh, the first, the previous slide showed the inclusion of the topics in the curriculum. When it comes to implementation, uh, it's a different story. So it, we see more colors here. Uh, with regards to the, the course syllabus means the, the details already of the curriculum implemented by the different universities or colleges. So for all four courses, there's a lot of variability um, in implementing the curriculum and uh, putting the details in the course syllabus. The references were outdated for the three courses. So that's why it's red for the more medicine, nursing and midwifery and only updated for nutrition. With regards to teaching hours, that's with the uh, with regards to didactics, it's very limited. Um, over three year, four years, um, there are some schools that only have 16 hours dedicated to all nutrition topics. And MIYCN is only a chunk of that 16 hours. The skills here refers to um, time allotted to practicum or related learning experiences, where the students are actually given time to counsel or practice what they've learned. And it's dark orange because it's really a very limited time allotted to this, to the practicum or RLEs. In fact, some um, schools also mentioned that they have limited opportunities for students, student-patient interaction. And for that, they uh, usually um, prioritize other clinical topics rather than MIYCN. With regards to uh, the educators and perceptors for the three courses, that's medicine, nursing, and midwifery, uh, they have limited experience in MIYCN. Next. Okay, here we want to show the different um, stakeholders that we need to get on board with regards to health professional education. Uh, the second, second column shows the health education institutions. And we'll see that it's a mix of public and private institutions in Indonesia and the Philippines. However, in Laos and Myanmar, uh, these are all public institutions. There are regulatory agencies in place in all four countries and licensing, agent, licensing uh, requirements are being implemented in, at the time in three of the four um, countries, but uh, based on Paul's update a while ago, I think in Lao PDR it's already in place. And with regards to uh, professional organizations or organizations of 
higher educational institutions. They're available in three out of four countries. Next. Okay, so the gaps at the country level were already seen uh, based on the visuals a while ago. So I'd like here to focus on the opportunities, which include the ongoing revision of curricula. Um, in, the, in three of the four countries is being done in the context of the ASEAN MRA, which was already discussed by Paul a while ago. Uh, the third bullet here uh, cites the development of a nutrition course. This is in Myanmar, and we think it's a good opportunity also to um, enhance the MIYC and content in the nutrition course being developed. Next. Uh, at the regional level, the main gap is a non-standardized pre-service training curricula. And again, I'd like to underscore that the opportunity is the ASEAN MRAs uh, because it gives us the opportunity to include standardized competencies, both in pre-service training and even for professional um, development, the continuing professional development uh, to include MIYCN topics. As mentioned by Paul, the MRAs only exist for medicine, dentistry, and nursing. And we believe that in lobbying for the MRAs for midwifery and nutrition, uh, that's one area where we can also um, lobby for the inclusion of MIYCN content. Next. And this is my last slide. I'd like to share an experience in the Philippines where all the uh, stakeholders work together for the integration of EINC in the nursing curriculum. So the program implementers was uh, DOH or Ministry, Department or Ministry of Health. And they worked with um, the Association of Deans of the Colleges of Nursing all over the Philippines. So they conducted caravans to build the capacity of the educators to include EINC in the curriculum. And afterwards, they also worked with regulatory agencies for the inclusion in the mandated curriculum. Okay, so in summary, um, MIYC and content in health professional education in the four countries is not standardized. Graduates do not feel competent to manage or lead MIYC and programs. However, opportunities for standardization exist at the country level uh, with the curriculum revisions and at the regional level with the ASEAN MRA. But all stakeholders must be involved in standardizing and enhancing the MIYC and content in pre-service training. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you and over to you, Jane. Thank you so much, Dr. Castro, for really fascinating and important research. For us to see that although there's much progress that has been made, there also is much still to be done, both at the regional and country level. And that we as advocates and champions for MIYCN really need to come together and advocate to make sure that those gaps you've highlighted are filled. So thank you for giving us that food for thought. I move on to our next presenter now, and it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Fung Hu Yen, who is the Vice Director of food, the Food and Nutrition Training Center of the National Institute of Nutrition in Vietnam. And uh, Fung is going to be presenting to us on the Little Sun e-learning. Very exciting to hear a country experience in terms of their first online IYCF in-service training program uh, in Vietnam. So Fung, you are most welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jane, for the introduction. Uh, dear Madam Chair, the panelists and all participants, uh, good afternoon from the misty Hanoi. Thank you for giving Vietnam to present the case of the Little Sun e-learning, the first online IYCF uh, in-survey training in Vietnam and maybe probably the first in the region. I'm Phuong Huynh, the Vice Director of Food and Nutrition Training Center and National Institute of Nutrition Vietnam. Next, please. 
as many of you may know, uh, Alliance Tri started a um, uh, comprehensive and large scale project for IYCF improvement in Vietnam in 2009. And from uh, 2009 and 2014, it has set up uh, over 1,000 Little Sun franchises providing IYCF counseling service in 15 provinces over Vietnam. And for capacity building in this period, we employ traditional face-to-face -face training approach. From 2014 to 2016, the projects phased out and hand over to the government, which is the, our institute, National Institute of Nutrition. A sustainability plan has made to maintain the active uh, list of uh, 1,200 Little Sun franchises. And the question was how? taking into account the limited resource of human, of time and of space, and the need to scaling up. So the answer is e-learning. Therefore, the first ever e-learning program on IYCF was developed and launched in July 2017, and it has been in operation since then, with the objective to provide standardized and accredited uh, IYCN training for health system nationwide and to increase the accessibility uh, to IYCN knowledge. Next, please. This is a process to set up and run the program with three partners, uh, including developing uh, teaching models, test, launch, advertise, extend, access, uh, support, and management. And uh, in this partnership, ANT provided technical financial support. Hanoi University of Science and Technology was in charge of all technical system, and our institute, National Institute of Nutrition of MOH, was in charge of the cost content, operation, certification, and management. This cost play an important role in sustaining and scaling up ANT franchise model in Vietnam, as well as promoting optimal IYCN practices given limited resource for training and retraining. Next, please. So the training program is based on the national training curriculum endorsed by the Ministry of Health of Vietnam in 2014 with updates with the latest guidelines um, globally. It consists of, of uh, pre-recorded video clips using both platforms on the web and on the app. It had 20 models of which a nine model was given free for public to assess and certify course is an intended for the on-the-job training for health practitioner and even with the pre-service training for medical student. Uh, and it uh, includes a graded final exam and certificate issued by the National Institute of Nutrition. And the fee for the uh, certificate cost, uh, uh, cost about uh, 400, uh, for, uh, 40 US dollar. So the uh, section uh, structure include introduction, pre-test question, uh, training video, post-test question and summary along with full text material and illustration video clips. Next, please. So this is uh, some statistic uh, of the user in the last four years since the launch of the program. You can see free number, uh, free member about uh, over 600 and certified member over 800 uh, and uh, more than half of them are health workers. Uh, and you can see the number of um, user increase uh, in the last two years, um, especially during the pandemic in 2020. Uh, this is a statistic by October uh, this year. Next, please. And this is our challenge and opportunity of the program. Uh, the challenge is that there's no regulation on professional competency for nutrition counselors. So this is a, not a mandatory certificate for health worker at the uh, front um, in, 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 in the health, uh, health facilities. Um, there's a limitation of interaction, especially on the practice section and follow-up supervision. So this is a, a challenge for the e-learning in general. Um, and also it's a matter of cost to maintain and update even we collect some uh, fee for uh, for certification but it's not enough to maintain uh, the the program to run uh, 
And however, we found the opportunity, many people say that COVID-19 pandemic is a challenge, but as the uh, Vietnamese are very optimistic, we see uh, the, uh, the, the opportunity in this because distant learning become more common and become the norm. More people accept uh, e-learning as a, a new way of learning uh, versus a traditional face-to-face -face training. The opportunity is also with the Ministry of Health to, uh, with the process to develop a, a nutrition service package in universal health coverage, and in which IYCF counseling is one out of four services. So IYCF training for, for the um, uh, service provider become a must. Um, and the development of standards for preventive health um, force also make IYCF counseling skill uh, a must for health workers. Next, please. From this, next, please. So uh, from this, we uh, uh, have the way forward to uh, scaling up and maintain the program. It's um, uh, to improve and update the ongoing costs with other models like additional, like uh, management of severe malnutrition, micro deficiency prevention. And uh, recently we're thinking of uh, nutrition em emergency, especially in the uh, recently Philippines and Vietnam are hit by many uh, big so uh, uh, training uh, by uh, e-learning is, um, is a good solution at this moment. Uh, we should uh, create an online forum for Q&A uh, and discussion to increase the uh, uh, interaction between the um, um, uh, program and the learner, develop and execute uh, a marketing plan to generate more demand and advocacy for mandatory certific uh, certification, as well as to create reporting indicator to access the cost effectiveness. Next, please. My last slide is a key message uh, for the presentation and uh, from the e-learning uh, program experience of Vietnam. This is e-learning to replace traditional cascade training is inevitable in the context of Industry 4.0 and in the context of scaling up nutrition and COVID uh, pandemic. Development of professional regulation is important to facilitate the demand generation and it uh, even come before we set up the program. We should consider e-learning in combination with other alternative teaching modes, like the, so to increase its effectiveness and the quality of e-learning teaching. For example, like integrating in longer mandatory course for health staff, uh, or half a day face-to-face -face introduction uh, and followed by four days of self-learning, or other way to direct coaching via Zoom, that as we now teaching via Zoom uh, for many of nutrition uh, program in Vietnam. Uh, that's all of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, it's over to you, Jane. Thank you so much for, for really sharing that with us. And I think even though you said it's not mandatory, just seeing the number of people that have gone through the course shows that there really is a desire for this kind of learning. And I'm sure we'll have more questions when we come to the panel. But uh, thank you, Fong, for sharing that experience with us of the little sun. And I love the logo as well, really positive and exciting. Thank so you. we move on now to our next speaker. And it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Sri Sukutyo known to many of us as Ibu Ninik, who is the nutrition specialist for UNICEF uh, in Indonesia. But she is also presenting on behalf, as you can see here, of the Indonesian government. So it is a pleasure to have our Indonesian counterparts and colleagues with us. And Ninik is going to share with us Indonesia's experience on online learning for IYCF counseling. So Ninik, lovely to have you and the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Jane. Uh, good afternoon, panelists and participants. Um, it's an honor for us in Indonesia, the MOH and also UNICEF to have the opportunity to share the IYCF counseling training in Indonesia. Uh, just to let you know, the online is still in the process of the development. So next slide, please. 
Uh, let me start with the OICF situation in Indonesia. Uh, as you know, Indonesia is um, a decentralized country, uh, consists of 17,000 islands, the big one, with 34 provinces and 514 districts. And we have approximately around 10,000 health centers across the country. And if you can see from the slide that the infant and young child feeding uh, practices in Indonesia are still not optimal. For example, the percentage of children aged 6 to 23 months who fed minimally acceptable diet was only 40% in 2017, which is based on the IDHS data. Next slide, please. Um, Indonesia government adapted the global UNICEF AYSEF counseling course in 2012. Then the adaptation includes the changing um, the HIV component into the growth monitoring and to also strengthen the health component during the first 1000 days of life. And then this was followed by a pilot in six districts and scaled up to more than 90 districts in 13 provinces in 2014. Uh, the training course was finally accredited in 2019 as the government standard IYSAF counseling materials after having gone through national accreditation process. And in 2019, this accredited counseling course was rolled out nutrition, uh, nationwide using the National uh, Stunting um, uh, uh, Prevention Program as the platform. Next slide, please. In uh, 2019, the government established a pool of uh, more than 250 national um, and subnational facilitators who train health workers in 34 provinces. And you can see the numbers in the slide. Next slide, please. Um, a key bottleneck in implementing RSF program in Indonesia has been the limited capacity of the local community health workers on RSF counseling. Um, until 2018, a capacity building of uh, local community health workers on IYSAF counseling was managed by the local government because of this decentralized country and following the conventional cascade training mechanism with lack of quality standard, quality control mechanism, and also supportive supervision. However, since 2019, um, UNICEF and also the government, both the directorate um, of nutrition and also the BBP SDM or the Human Resource Agency uh, developed a new mechanism of accredited IYCF counseling training, which involved establishing a pool of national and subnational trainers on IYCF counseling, who could then they uh, who could then uh, they train their respective provinces to strengthen the capacity of the local community health workers on IYCF counseling. This enabled strengthening the quality standard and supportive supervision mechanism of subnational training on IYCF counseling. And um, just to inform you that the accredited training is targeted to those already in the health system. So nutritionists and also midwife and uh, some also the uh, health promotion uh, staff in the health system strength, uh, to, uh, to strengthen their capacity and reward their performance uh, using their credit points to advance their careers. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to the face-to-face uh, -face IYCF counseling training we, I just described, uh, just in the early 2020, the government um, with the support of UNICEF and other partners has embarked on the process of the development of online counseling training curriculum. Um, as you know, um, e-learning can be a cost-effective approach for in-service training as well as an efficient way to reach wider audiences across Indonesia. Uh, internet coverage is estimated to be around 82%, reaching 423 districts out of 514 districts. And almost all health centers in the country, including the one in the remote area, has internet access. And uh, we plan also in the discussion that the course will also be accredited because we realized that uh, a training program, when it is institutionalized, then uh, it will be more sustainable and scalable in a big and decentralized country as Indonesia. Next slide, please. 
This is uh, the content of the online um, training curriculum. It consists of five models. One is the IYCF concept. And then the uh, second one is infant and child nutrition, which includes breastfeeding, complementary feeding, growth monitoring, feeding for young children, including the, the, uh, during emergencies such as COVID. And then the third model is on maternal nutrition. The fourth model is on uh, breaking under nutrition cycle, starting from the adolescent. And then the uh, uh, last one is on the counseling itself. So um, the plan is that accredited certificate uh, with performance credit will be uh, awarded upon completion of an assignment at the end of the course. So we um, ask the participant or the learners to have some sort of assignment that, that uh, before they can get this uh, accredited certificate. And uh, just to let you know also that this module is developed based on the traditional face-to-face -face training materials. Next slide, please. So um, this is just the uh, component of the um, online uh, learning that uh, we are developing. We have the navigation, which is um, can be used as a real-time instruction, but uh, also there's a glossary and reference materials. There's also the, the we use the multimedia, a mix of media elements uh, in the right proportion. So we have the technical interview, question and answer, podcast, lectures, video, and we will also use audio narration as a method of content delivery and quotation to highlight a specific points. And then we also have interaction and also the test and assessment uh, or quizzes. Next slide. Uh, finally, this is um, will be my final slide. So I'd like to highlight the opportunities and challenges on the IYCF counseling training in Indonesia. So uh, the opportunities is because Indonesia at the moment is um, implementing the national stunting reduction movement. And this become the platform to roll out the IYCF capacity development program. In 2021, the focus district will be spread to 360 districts across 34 provinces. And then the second one, both accredited face and face-to-face -face and online learning will hopefully can reach more health workers compared just the face-to-face. But we also have challenges in, um, in um, just an example of this, because of this COVID pandemic, it has slowed down or delayed the face-to-face -face tra uh, training. And also because the online, we are still in the early stage on having the, the system into the government, uh, Ministry of Health system for the online course. So the government also needs time to establish the system itself and to roll up um, um, across the country. So um, if we have time, um, I'd like to share a video that shows a bit on the online course. And with this, I thank you for the time provided for Indonesia to share the experience. Thank you. Halo, selamat datang di materi pelatihan 1 konsep PMBA. Untuk informasi lebih lanjut mengenai materi pelatihan ini, berikut deskripsinya. Ikuti setiap materi yang ada dengan baik dan dapatkan stempel di akhir materi pelatihan ini. Selamat belajar! Thank you so much, uh, Ibu Ninik, for sharing that with us. And even if we couldn't fully understand those of us that don't speak the local language, we could really see from the video how interactive it is and how it really moves people through the modules and, and through the process. So really appreciate it. We're going to move now into a time where firstly, we're just going to have two brief comments. 
So if I can ask our colleagues um, from UNICEF in Mongolia and the UNICEF regional office, uh, Muji and Jess, to please put their cameras on. Excellent, lovely to see you. And then after we've had a chat to the two of them, we're going to uh, ask all our panelists to join us. So let me start uh, with asking uh, you, Muji, who's the nutrition officer at UNICEF in Mongolia. I'm going to give you just a few minutes to share with us some of the brief highlights that Mongolia has in terms of this pre and in service learning. So Muji, share with us some of your experiences. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jane, and greetings to everyone from Mongolia. And uh, <clears throat> one of the modified activity due to COVID-19 pandemic uh, for Mongolia's nutrition program was that uh, we have introduced online interactive training on infant and young child feeding counseling uh, and also the waste management. So normally each of them is a five day face-to-face uh, -face training and because the uh, government imposed the restriction of uh, public gatherings and trainings since March uh, 2020, we, uh, uh, in consultation with the Ministry of Health, we decided to shift to online training modality. So for this activity, we collaborated with the Mongolian National University of Medical Sciences, Sciences we have been cooperating with them since uh, 2017 to introduce pre-service nutrition curricula. And one of the advantage of the medical university was that uh, they had uh, they have uh, the e-learning center with the multimedia studio and uh, they have very well established online e-learning e system in the country. So the development of the online uh, uh, interactive training models took place from May to June this year. And for infant and young child feeding counseling, we the five models were created. And for waste management training, uh, seven models were created. And the duration of each training model is approximately 30 minutes. And uh, the training rollout started from July to October. And the participants were required to complete the above trainings within 21 days. And after completing the online trainings, uh, they uh, have received, participants received one or two day on the job coaching on hands-on skills. And uh, those who have passed training tests have received credit certificate. And um, that's all from my side and over to you, really Jane. really interesting and it's just great to see how all the countries are looking at opportunities, are exploring what they can do. And I think when we come to the q and I've seen some great questions already in the Q&A box. So thank you everyone, we'll get to those now. But Jess, I'm going to come to you now. And I think again, everyone knows uh, Jessica Blankenship who's the regional nutritional as uh, nutrition specialist at UNICEF IACRO. Jeff, uh, let's hear a few more remarks also on the importance of addressing maternal nutrition and making sure that we're we're covering that whole mother-child diet. Thank you, Jane. Yes, I wanted to just uh, come back to a, a mention that Paul had stated on the development of a maternal nutrition model chapter. So I just wanted to, to lay out a save this space to all the participants here to this webinar. And that's where um, UNICEF EPRO is, is leading in the development of a model chapter for maternal nutrition. This is in the same style as the WHO model chapter for infant young child feeding. And the model chapter is textbook focused. So it's a narrative textbook base that lays out maternal nutrition in four major components. The first is why is maternal nutrition important? So stating the cases for health workers why maternal nutrition needs to be included. The second is what is needed to achieve good maternal nutrition. And this is everything from 
what are the essential uh, nu nutrients that, that women need during pregnancy and lactation? And then also how can they be encouraged to make wise food choices and what to do to make those linkages when healthy foods are not available and affordable? The third one is how can the health worker facilitate good maternal nutrition? And I think this is what makes it a little bit more unique of what's not available right now in a lot of the curriculum uh, globally for maternal nutrition. Because it's not just what to do of the essential services that need to be provided, but how can the health worker provide those, those messages? So what are the different forms of communication that could be provided, both one-on-one -on -one personal communication um, and other forms of counseling and information sharing? And then lastly, uh, what this uh, model chapter uh, is attempting to do is focusing on not just when everything goes well, but what happens when there are situations that need separate counseling and messaging. So the pregnant woman is not gaining enough weight. A woman starts her pregnancy already overweight or gaining too much weight, which can put the baby and her own health at risk. And also anemia and gestational diabetes. So what are specific counseling messages that need to be provided to the pregnant woman during these special cases? And how can the health worker feel better and more empowered to address these situations? So the, the model chapter is under development now and it will be included in the ASEAN Guidance and Minimum Standards for Maternal Nutrition to be released in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. That's great to end with uh, something to look forward to. So I am sure everyone will be delighted when it comes out. So thank you for alerting us to that. If I can ask all our speakers to also join us, if possible, with their cameras now, uh, Paul, Ina, Fung, Ninik, we're great to have all of you on. Uh, lovely, thank you for putting your cameras on as well. We've had some excellent questions in the Q&A box and thank you also to our speakers who've been answering questions as we go. But there's one question that does keep coming up and I think I'm going to put this one to you please, Paul. Um, We've had it uh, that we thought of, I thought of it as well when you were speaking and I see our C our Cambodian colleagues have also asked it. And this is about how do countries go about um, adapting the e-learning subjects and training material and the whole course to their own country language and their own country context. So if you can give us some information on what guidance you have from countries who are interested in adapting or adopting the course. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jade, and thanks for the question. So there's no, um, I think there's no one answer for to this question. The the question that needs to be asked by countries first is who will be who will be the recipients of the training, and second is what is available. Um, a, a learning we have from from Vietnam and from the global e-learning course is that. If there is authoritative material in country, for example, if the country has their own government endorsed IYCF counseling course, then maybe you don't need to take the global counseling course and uh, maybe you can maybe you can work on your own uh, widely accepted course and convert it to an e-learning format, which is what Vietnam did. Uh, we had to use the WHO course because it's a uh, uh, our global e-learning course is global. Therefore, we couldn't use one single country guidelines and we had to use the main source text. Uh, but, but the second question that countries need to ask is what are the competencies that you want to address? It's not just building a course, it's what, what are the competencies you want to work on and, and of whom? Is it for nurses, for midwives, for, for medical doctors? It might be a bit different for each of them. So rather than thinking first about what you have and what you can translate, think about the competencies first and build from there. Some of the material from the global course are more suited towards, uh, for example, let's say um, uh, basic breastfeeding troubleshooting, but maybe a little less suited to counseling skills that, that in some way uh, needs to have a strong face-to-face -face component. So it's not, uh, it's not like you can just develop one course for uh, for any that can be applicable to any context, but I will say that translation uh, is is vital because, of course, uh, um, the country needs to own it and it needs to be more widely used. Uh, 
So those are the considerations. So I'm not sure if I answered the question straightforward, but uh, we always advocate that please make sure you answer these questions first. But but um, when you're ready to take the next step, then we can provide some support in terms of that's what, what technology we use. Say, Paul, is that of course also our country colleagues are welcome to make direct contact. Uh, with the Alive and Thrive uh, and UNICEF team around these issues and to be able to have one-on-ones around the, uh, the needs that they might have as a country. So thank you, Paul. That brings me to a question that I want to go to, to you for, Tung. I want to ask you that you noted that one of the challenges you've had with the little uh, Sun e-learning is generating demand uh, for that e-learning. Can you tell us some of your future plans uh, for demand generation that maybe we can also learn from in the other countries as well? So if I can ask you, Fung. Yes, thank you for the questions. Uh, for demand generation, um, because now uh, we uh, are working with the MOH to uh, create the uh, standard uh, for a health worker in the front uh, in, in, in preventive health. Uh, because one of the questions that one of participants asking how to um, uh, making it mandatory. So uh, making it uh, with the MOH to have a professional qualification of the uh, health worker to make it mandatory for health worker to take the course. And on the other side, we are thinking of uh, um, um, expanding to the pre-service training. So I think uh, it's very useful that we learn from Mary about the um, um, uh, assessment of the pre-service training uh, curriculum in Vietnam and see any opportunity to put the program in, in the pre-service training. So uh, put it in, in both pre-service and in-service training. Great, thank you, Fong. And, and Mary, I'm, I'm going to come back, uh, to you now and, and ask you a question that I think also fits with what we're having in this discussion is you in your presentation noted that a partnership between educational institutions, professional organizations and program implementers is really the ideal approach. And so can you give us some advice on how you think you go around and you achieve this also in your example of building those partnerships so that we really get optimal collaboration, which I think then will help the demand generation, which will help countries have a need to develop these courses. So over to you. Hey, thanks for the question, Jane. Um, in my example, I think uh, it would be for Indonesia and the Philippines, it would be in the form of a public-private partnership. Uh, but in Lao PDR and Myanmar, countries like Lao PDR and Myanmar, it will be uh, more of a closer coordination between different government agencies. Um, so for, for the Philippines, for example, what we would do is we would probably talk with the uh, DOH, uh, as Paul mentioned, um, identify the competencies that we really need to have with in frontline health workers with regards to MIYCN, uh, and then talk uh, hold a dialogue with the different um, because here we have um, organizations of higher educational institutions for each course. So for the for medicine, there's an association of medical educators. For nursing, there's a separate one. So um, I would go, I would actually uh, want to plan um, feedbacking, sharing the, the results of this study with them uh, because some of them were actually key informants during the study, but we haven't had the opportunity to give uh, more comprehensive feedback to all of them. And then based on that, have joint planning with the Department of Health on how these can be, um, how we can improve the curriculum to include these competencies, to give uh, focus on these competencies, and then lobby this uh, with the regulatory agencies. So right. that's Thank it. You back so to you, much. Jane. And Paul, I'm going to come back to you now, because I think in any country planning this, you touched on it, but we need to remember that when uh, the private sector and those uh, like infant formula manufacturers hear about countries feeling a need for these kind of e-learning courses, 
uh, that's an ideal opportunity for them to step in and say, oh, we'll support, we'll offer. So Paul, I just want to ask you again to just highlight us, what steps should be taken to ensure that these gaps in providing e-learning actually aren't filled by stakeholders who have conflict of interest? How should that be handled? Ah, you just gave me a really good question, Jane. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm always a big fan of uh, safeguards imposed by government. So invariably when we talk about uh, training of health workers, especially for regulated professions, we need, to, we need to work with our regulatory bodies and agencies and not just the Ministry of Health. It may not be immediately evident to them that conflict of interest is a problem. Again, this is related to this culture of dependency on the industry. That's a different matter altogether. Uh, but we need to flag this as an issue and institute safeguards in the same way that they've instituted safeguards for issues like, uh, let's say, tobacco or if there's broader regulation on um, conflict of interest in food marketing, for example. So uh, I think in the Philippines, the, I think there was some, some um, safeguard in place to make sure that approvals of these courses are centralized. Uh, it's done for any training that gives CME, but and e-learning should not be an exception to that. So let's just make sure there's a clear policy in place for it. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question in, in full, Jane, but, no, but it's... You, I think you have answered it, and it yeah. really is. It, it's just important that everybody has this on their radar, that people are aware that people and organizations and companies with conflicts of interest are going to be looking for this gap, and we need to be very much alerted to it. Uh, Jane, if I, may, may I share a really quick, quick cautionary tale? So, uh, in the Philippines, when there there was a law, a, a law that required a certain number of units for for uh, continuing medical education, uh, there was an immediate, res almost immediate response from the industry to go to midwives and say that we can provide this course for you. You don't have to pay to go to Manila to take it. So there was no safeguard for that. Uh, so again, like you said, Jade, they are always one step ahead. So let's. Let's be faster. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. And I think that links then nicely to what I want to ask you about, Ninik, because uh, Ninik, a, a really key thing for so many professionals is some kind of accreditation. Either we have to get certain uh, continuing education points or it's just something we would like to be able to say we are accredited for. So can you share with us uh, briefly, Ninik, a little bit more about your experience in Indonesia with the accreditation process, because that seems to be a very big part of what you are looking at. And if there's any one key lesson you would advise other countries as they look at accreditation. Um, using the accreditation, accreditation is also an incentive for the health workers because they will uh, receive a credit points that can be used to um, to, to like like in, um, like increase the, the the performance and then probably some incentive uh, to their work and also using this accreditation then we have a body that really standardizes the training um, itself so it will be and, and in terms of uh, sustainability when it is uh, embedded institutionalized into this Ministry of Health Human Resources Agency then it is going to be like. Um, everybody needs to join this training if they really want to have some credit points and also increase the capacity to do the, the work, uh, IYCF counseling works. Thank you. I'm going to keep you on, Linick, because a question has uh, just come up from our, one of our colleagues on, in Vietnam, is how do we ensure quality for e-learning? What do we embed in quality? So maybe I'll start with you, Ninik, and then uh, Mary, if I can come to you on your thoughts about making sure that any of these e-learnings have quality uh, controls built into them. Ninik, you first. Yeah, so, so, so this is the plan with the Ministry of Health, the mechanism that we plan to build for the, to ensure the quality. So in order for the learners to get some um, accredit uh, accreditation, accreditation point, the credit points, then they have to complete with an assignment. In this assignment, then you have to do some skill competency where, where they have to do counseling skills like with, with their colleagues. And also when they have to also do like um, 
how to prepare food for the six to eight months or eight to 11 months. So it's, it's different, um, different consistency, different. So how they, they prepare the food for, and also for breastfeeding, how to do some position, attachment and so on. So this is kind of skills that they have to build um, at the end of the, uh, the training and they have to upload uh, into some sort of very uh, video in as part of the assignment. So at the end, um, there will be the, the, the facilitators that will review the assignment and um, giving some um, whether they pass the, the the training or not. So that yeah. kind of the um, uh, quality assurance or the competency that we plan to build. Thank you. Great, uh, Mary, to you, and then I'll come to you, Fung, to tell you uh, for you to share with us how you ensure quality in your program. But Mary, what's your experience coming out of, of the work and research you've done? Hi, Jean. I think that, um, well, for the for ensuring the quality, if you look at that, remember the triangle, the tripartite partnership I showed, I think it would be more of um, the, the, the one on top program managers and the regulatory agencies that need more uh, closer coordination with regards to this. Because like in the Philippines, these two groups don't really work together. There's the regulatory agency just looks at whether it's complying, whether the objectives are submitted, but the content is, but the, the um, curation of the content would be more of under the remit of the ministries of, of the Department of Health. So I think uh, with regards to stakeholders, there would be, there would, uh, you would need to have more closer coordination between these different agencies to ensure so to quality. There certainly is a component of quality being looked at in who, and people know whose responsibility. And gestational diabetes, which are much more serious concerns that need targeted counseling and, and follow-up. Um, the chapter also then integrates food-based dietary guidelines. So they could be modified for individual countries using foods that are available in your country to really provide targeted advice to women. So rather than just telling a woman who's pregnant eat a healthy diet, really providing that next level of guidance and, and looking at what they're eating and how we can provide tar targeted guidance to individual women. Great, thank you, Jess. And my very last question, I'm gonna squeeze it in, in the time I have is, is to you, uh, Muji. Can you tell us perhaps one of the key lessons that you have learned from this experience? If you were to say, to all this audience, and we have a hundred odd people listening to this webinar, if you were set to say to them, one thing you need to take home and remember as you go down this journey, it would be, what would you say it would be, Muji? Yeah, I think uh, the one, um, the thing that really impressed me uh, from e-learning is that uh, the coverage so in a very uh, short time, for example, in Mongolia case from July to October, we reached 4,000 health workers. So I, I think that was uh, really impressive. Great, thank you. And I think with that coverage comes the challenges. And I know that uh, Paul really raised that as well as we've always got to remember that not everybody has access uh, to the internet or to really good internet to be able to do these e-learning modules. And we also need to always remember that and be making sure that we are also thinking of those who don't have access, but still require the training. And that's another area that really needs to be considered as we put these together. I think all our speakers and our panelists have done an incredible job of of making me feel really excited about the idea and the opportunities they are for e-learning and how we can take what the COVID-19 pandemic has done in not allowing us to have those face-to-face -face trainings. And instead of feeling despondent about it, being able to grasp this opportunity of how can we learn and share from each other. And this is just the start of the sharing colleagues please feel you can continue to engage with our speakers and with each other to really say, how can we make the most out of this particular challenge that we have, but the many opportunities our speakers have shared with us. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Roger, 
uh, to give us the closing remarks as we come to the end of a fabulous webinar number two. Roger, over to you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, there are over a million registered physicians and nurses in Southeast Asia. Half of them, they join the various health services. So pre and in service learning, therefore needs to reach millions of students and health workers in the region. So we need to think coverage, like Mugi said, for Mongolia. Learning is a constant issue and online learning is an important means, not perfect, but effective. So the presentations today, they give us some ideas of where we are and where we need to go. So I would really like to thank the presenters uh, and the participants for an enlightening and very interactive webinar. Uh, you shared creative ideas and practical new solutions to improve the, the competencies of health workers in addressing nutrition. We also heard that uh, earlier advances in e-learning for nutrition made us more resilient during the pandemic. So we heard that from Mongolia, we heard it from Vietnam and that e-learning is a strategy for both sustainability and scale. We also heard that blended or alternative uh, learning experiences are recommended to develop new skills and actual competencies. We also need to act with some urgency where our e-learning solutions are not yet available um, to ensure that learning gaps is not filled by stakeholders with conflict of interest. We also have a global e-learning course available that uh, I hope we can all promote to reach thousands or even millions. Um, and we have expertise in the countries uh, that uh, I hope we can all tap into as we develop new e-learning opportunities. And although we see a boom in the number of registered uh, e-learners, we should not forget about what Paul uh, called the digital divide. Uh, in the countries um, in this region, but also by gender. So we need to find some solutions to that. And some of the immediate one that I came up with was improving access to, uh, we cannot improve in access to internet probably, that's beyond our mandate, uh, but we can easily include options such as downloadable and offline content in the e-learning. So when you actually have access to, to internet, you can, you can prepare and then you can study when you're offline. So beyond e-learning, there are also other country level shifts in, in how we design and implement both pre-service um, pre -service learning mostly. So including the move from content to competency-based uh, curriculums, standardization, regulations was mentioned, and licensing of medical professionals. And ASEAN plays an important role in these efforts, including with what, um, was mentioned the mutual recognition arrangements uh, or the MRA to facilitate the flow of professionals in the region, considering relevant domestic regulations and also market demand conditions. So both UNICEF and Alive and Thrive are endorsed technical assistance providers uh, to the ASEAN Health Cluster. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone that uh, we are always available for technical support uh, even though face-to-face -face country visits is, is not really easy at the moment, and also learning exchange opportunities is, is not possible. So let me conclude by also saying a million thanks to you, Jane, uh, for moderating this session, uh, the co-organizers from UNICEF, and the commitments from both the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Irish Aid. And a thousand welcomes to Lisa Doherty from Irish Aid, who is now in the region and in Hanoi. So thank you. Thank you so much, Roger, for those closing remarks. And really a reminder to all of you that you will receive the link to the recording of this webinar. I have put in the chat box the link to the e-learning course, but we will make sure that that is also sent to all of you. And we did see the request for the email of all of the presenters. 
So we will discuss with them their willingness for us to share their emails with you all in case you want to connect with them on the work they're doing. And as we come to the close, just to remind you all to make sure that you save the date on the 2nd of December at exactly the same time for the final webinar in this series before we come to the meeting that Roland told you about in the early part of the new year. But webinar three on the 2nd of December will have a wonderful conversation about what measured matters and designing strong data information systems to inform program and policy modifications. So it's a not to miss third part of the series. And thank you once again to all of you for joining this webinar. We ask you to stay safe and keep well until we meet you again on the 2nd of December. And again, to all our panelists, thank you everybody for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us. Goodbye, stay safe. Thank you very much all.